Captain's Log, Stardate 052420. It's been a strange time, as people have now go leaving their house to go out into the public. As they have been called COVIDiots, they have gathered in many places, beaches in Vancouver, streets in all across America, and at a park in Toronto. Meanwhile, the game of hockey appears to be moving forward as meetings have happened and there's a possibility of a return. Four strange people gather together to discuss this on the Hockey Podcast. <laughs> Back for another week of hockey discussion. Welcome to the Hockey Podcast. My name is Kevin Olenek. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, K-E-V-O-L-E. You can follow the Hockey Podcast on Twitter as well at podcast underscore hockey uh, and Facebook the Hockey Podcast. Uh, Spreaker.com K-E-V-O-L-E is where you can find all podcasts or you can subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or Apple as the kids call it these days. Uh, we uh, had we uh, had some interesting technical issues, but we have survived. Chris, have we survived our technical issues? As long as there isn't an echo and we can all hear each other and see each other, I think we are good to go. Yes, this was a this was quite a quite an adventure getting getting this all set up for today for some reason. But it was my fault, right, Sean? It's my fault. Well, at least we we can blame someone. Yes. <laughs> Whatever in doubt, blame Kevin. Uh, and Tyler is with us as well. Hello, Tyler. Yeah, I thought it got hilarious when you appeared on the screen three times. <laughs> yes, yes, there was three of me. It was pretty definitive we could allocate the blame to you. Yes, it's pretty that. clear that it was... It <laughs> Trying was... to hog all the space on this on this podcast. <laughs> yes. yes, because, well, we're, we're shorthanded. Uh, we're killing off penalties. Uh, Two-man disadvantage as Heidi and Devin are in the penalty box. Uh, unable to... <laughs> Unable to participate. Although I heard rumors Heidi is lurking, so she maybe she pops in and says hello or something. Who who knows? Uh, if she does, great. Um, but as mentioned, there is some news. Isn't it exciting to actually talk about almost the potential of actual the seventy percent possibility of hockey news? Doesn't that excite you in some way? Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm tired, I'm tired. I, I, but I'm still waiting for the actual hockey. I'm tired of hypotheticals at this point. Yeah. Well, here we are with a new hypothetical. What has been speculated for some time has now been approved by the NHL uh, PA. Uh, it will be a 24 team playoff format. The top four seeds in the East and the top four seeds in the West will be doing a round robin tournament to uh, play into which seed that they are. So in the West, that's Vegas, Dallas, Colorado, and St. Louis. And in the East, that is Boston, Tampa, Washington, and why am I drawing a blank at at another team here? It's there's another team, um, and then the rest uh, are playing. The other ones are playing in a best of five playoff series, which has the Vancouver Canucks would be playing the Minnesota um, Wild. I almost wanted to call them the Twins, and then I almost wanted to call them the Vikings in the same time. So I moved to the Wild, which is which is good. And then we would have the Winnipeg Jets would be taking on the Calgary Flames. And then in, we also would be having the Blackhawks would be playing the Edmonton Oilers. And we would be having the Predators facing the Coyotes in the West. In the East, uh, unless I have this all wrong, it's the Canadians would be taking on the Penguins. Uh, the Flyers would be in the top four. So the Canadians would be taking on the uh, Penguins. Uh, Penguins. We would have the Maple Leafs taking on the Columbus Blue Jackets. The 
Rangers play the Hurricanes, it looks like, and it's Islanders Panthers, I believe. Um, man, I feel so prepared for this. Uh, anyway, um, what's okay? So we will start uh, with Chris. What are the pros of this new playoff format? Hypothetical playoff format. Like I, I I'm, I've done my best to like fully understand how it's going to break down. Like I, I know that we would theoretically play Minnesota for a five game series, and at that point, one of the first four seeds would be who we played in the second round. Like I'm just okay with having hockey back. Period. Like there's going to be no ideal perfect situation that way, where it works out for every team, and every team is super happy with how it plays out, but. We get playoff hockey. I'll take what I can get. Sean, Tyler, what do you think? Yeah, uh, there's no going to be. There's not going to be a um, a perfect solution. There's not going to be a solution that uh, will be will have the what we're used to. Uh, so we have to kind of figure out. And, and settle for what's what the best solution that we can that can become that can come up with be come up with uh, to come to have the uh, to cover everything and 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 cover and to make things work under the these situations this this situation. So I think that uh, doing a twenty four team tournament is probably the best way to go. Um, even if you, even if one of the the, the non top 16 teams wins it they had to go through an extra an extra uh what an extra series to to win this the cup i don't i don't see why that's uh that that should be they should uh give it that uh, any more of an asterisk than any of the other shortened seasons so let before we get tyler here before we go let me correct myself as i stumble through this so the play-in rounds are in the east it would be the number five seed playing the number 12 seed montreal uh, number six, Carolina would be playing number 11, the Rangers. Number seven, Islanders would be playing the Panthers. Number eight, Toronto would be playing the Jackets. The winner of the Pittsburgh-Montreal uh, series would be playing the fourth seed, which at this point is the Philadelphia Flyers. The winner of the Carolina Rangers series would be playing the number three seed, the Washington Capitals, uh, which I almost called the Nationals for some reason. The Islanders and Panthers would be winner would be playing at this point the number two seed Tampa Bay and the Blue, uh, Maple Leafs and the Blue Jackets would be playing the Bruins. In the West, it would be the Oilers versus the Blackhawks with the winner playing the number four seed, which at this point is the Dallas Stars. Nashville would be playing Arizona, which the winner would be playing Vegas. Van, or the number three seed, Vancouver, Minnesota, seven versus ten would be playing the number two seed, which is at this point Colorado, and then Calgary versus Winnipeg, the winner would be playing the St. Louis Blues. Sorry, I wanted to get to make sure that was cleared. Now, now go ahead, Tyler. I, I just think the twenty-four team format's the most uh, practical solution given the circumstances. Uh, I think everybody can be pretty well in agreement that the seven teams that would not be part of it were seven teams that that really didn't have any kind of chance. Um, definitively before the, uh, the pause happened. So, um, so it's, it's good. And, and I think as long as it's whittled, once it's whittled down to 16 teams and you're doing it east west brackets ending up in a Stanley Cup final, four rounds from there, 16 wins to hold the cup. Uh, I, you know, I, I think in, in, for integrity purposes, that's as best as they can come up with here. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I didn't like it at first. I'll be honest. I thought maybe we could have some regular season play to kind of solve this. They get to the sixteen because I, 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 you know, I, I still feel that there needs to be some. Uh, there need we still need the integrity of the cup. I think there there have been players that have been talking about that. Um, so I, I would have liked to see some regular season, but when you look at this, this almost is the same as a playoff chase because really it's a best of five. I, I mean, really the most that you were going to play in terms of regular season games for anybody would have probably have been five or seven. So the play in way I think is a really, it's a good way to do that, uh, to solve that problem. The, other issue, but the other 
if I'm the Edmonton Oilers, um, and I, I'm I'm not the Edmonton Oilers, but would you feel a little bit frustrated by this? You're second in the division, uh, and this is one of the challenges that we're dealing with right now is because we do not have an equal amount of games played. We're going by winning percentage. If you're the Oilers, do you feel a little screwed? You're second in your division. Yeah, I think you. Yeah, but you're not the you're not the, uh, the the division leader where you automatically get into that that top part. So, I mean, there are going to be teams that benefit from this, uh, Montreal, namely, and then there are going to be other teams that don't uh, benefit from it and have to play their way in, like the Oilers. And yeah, I think they they have a right to feel a little. A little jobbed by this, but again, it's unprecedented times, and we need to. And they just, they just need to win. Just yeah. use their motivation to win. At this point, if that if they feel that uh, that jobbed by the by this uh, system. As far as feeling jobbed goes, I mean, I'm just trying to look up the standings here, but uh, you know, there were still enough games left on the schedule for every team for it to go sideways for them, right? Like if they, if we had finished the 82 game season, let's say it was only like a two or three week pause to the season and they just tacked on, you know, just pushed the schedule back or whatever. I mean, there was an opportunity there for teams to falter. You know, everybody's looking at it like, oh, I'm being screwed. Well, I mean, had you played the full season, would you have still made it or would you have fallen off the cliff? I mean, you can look at it both ways there. Um, I mean, like I said, I, I think twenty four the twenty four team format with the extra round to play in is is as best as they can come up with. Um, there, there is not good as Chris said, not going to be a solution that makes everybody happy. That and if you if for the people who do have the athletic subscription and have, were, was following the uh, uh, Dom Lachishan's, uh sort of simulated Earth Two season as they dubbed it. Uh, the the Oilers missed the playoffs. <laughs> they had like a three percent or like a five percent chance of missing the playoffs, and they missed the playoffs. <laughs> so it, it can happen. Um, yeah. So at this point, you you take your yeah point percentage top four teams in each conference, and then the rest uh, have to play their way in. I think that's fair. I have seen the, the the suggestion. Why aren't they just starting with the sixteen teams? Well, I think when you don't have evenness in the games played column, um, the what ifs there become the issue. So, you know, expand it to twenty four. Come up with a creative format. Um, you know, again, it's about making a compromise here. Yeah. Yeah, Chris, what, did you have anything to? Nope. Don't have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, the least amount of uh, games played by anybody were the Islanders with 68. Uh, Then everyone else, the most, was 71. So, I mean, I guess either, you know, it's six points, I guess, one way or the other. But, um, yeah, I, I can't think of anything that is, you know, I... This is about as fair as we're going to make it. And really, the, uh, and almost in a way, if you just went with the 16, it almost actually is unfair for some of these teams that were mathematically into it. Like if you compare the, the NBA where in the East it was a five-game difference or ten-point difference if you want to use NHL lingo uh, between eighth and ninth, and seven points between eighth and ninth in the West. There's a lot legitimate argument to just have your 16 teams in the playoffs in here, uh, and but in the in the NHL there was a playoff battle, and this is probably as good of a way to do it as as possible. Uh, I think. Um, sort of. I guess one of the things that I think is also coming up here, and there was an interesting debate between Pass It to Bullets and Trevor Martins, particularly on Twitter, that I saw. But there have been a few other people kind of chiming in on this as well um, about the idea, really, of not doing this at all. So I guess my question to you is, do you think that there are going to be people that are not going to watch this or are going to put an... 
put the asterisk on this because this shouldn't have happened? <laughs> or yes, does it matter? But I just don't know why. Like the the two lockout shortened seasons were forty eight regular game regular seasons. Um, but if you're going to say it shouldn't have happened, like you're you're completely ignoring the fact that the, the, that our world that we live in, as flawed as it is, runs up, runs on money. So if you're if you're getting upset about people using, um, using money as an, an excuse to do this, then you're not paying attention to what the world is. Money makes the world go round. Yeah, and I made the comment on on Twitter yesterday about this. Uh, you know, it's, it's just ignorant to say, "Oh, just cancel it, just just whatever." It just it doesn't matter. Who, who cares? Like, wait, <laughs> there's lots of there's lots of people that have a stake in trying to uh, make an economic recovery here around hockey. Uh, there, there's a there is a lot of people affected, right? From owners who are bleeding it right now, players, team staff, arena staff. Uh, broadcasters, other media. I, I mean, it, it goes way down even to the level of a you know neighborhood pub owner that shows games and benefits from people coming in to watch the games. I mean, it, so the idea that they're going to you know just cancel it. Well, okay, you could do that, and then maybe maybe get the next season started on time. Except that you know there's <laughs> there's way more money to try and recover out of having some kind of playoff going on. You know, like when John brought up the lockout short in seasons, they didn't burn playoff games in that process. They kept the playoff games and, and sacrificed the regular season games. So, um, you know, that like I say, it's just, it's just kind of ignorant to say, well, you know, the economics don't matter. Of course they do. Exactly. And I, as, as much as we all want to see this fixed and, and, the, all, all, all of us go back to whatever the normal is once this is all done. Um, I don't, I don't, we have to start, start going, getting back to whatever the normal is soon, like at, at some point. And it's just, I just don't know why, I just don't know why you have to go full on uh, like idealistic on this and instead of looking at it and going, okay, how can we make this work? And is there a way to make this work? Mm-hmm. The, you know, you, it, 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 sorry. I was just going to say, as in regards to the asterisk, Kevin, uh, you know, the people that are going to put asterisks on are, 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 you know, it's going to depend on, on which teams they don't like are succeeding, <laughs> you know, like, you know, so like, uh, uh, if the Leafs were to end up winning the Stanley Cup out of all of this, are people like us that that you know kind of take our jabs at the Leafs? Are we going to put the asterisk on there? I think we'd be more inclined to want to do that <laughs> than if, say, the Flames or the Canucks were the winners, or a hypothetical situation where they gave out the Stanley Cup to the team that had the most points, which would be Boston. And I'm pretty sure most Canuck fans would be like, "Screw that!" Yeah. Yeah. Well- yeah, and I mean, I to just I did do to, for the part about the players not or canceling the season. A lot of the same people that are asking for cancellation of the season are asking for owners to pay staff uh, while they're off, and you can't do it if you don't have money. I I mean I I'm not I'm I'm no economist I'm no scientist I'm no mathematician, but you can't do pay something if you don't have money to pay it. So that's where I feel that there's a bit of a seems to be a little bit of a disconnect to the from the cancellation part. And the other part I think of this in terms of the asterisk, I, I agree with you, Tyler, that I think a lot of people would look at the, this is going to be depending on the team. Um, but the other on the other side of this is is the beauty of the probably the most beautiful thing of the of the NHL playoffs over the NFL or the NBA for sure. Major League Baseball, you can sort of see anyone can win. Is in the NHL, anyone can win. We have seen a number eight seed win a Stanley Cup. The LA Kings were in a number eight seed and won a Stanley Cup. So 
you know, uh, and a Tam- Tampa Bay Lightning last year were a number one seed by a country mile and got swept in the first round. The Calgary Flames were the number one seed in the Western Conference, were beaten five games. So that's the beauty of the, the playoffs. And I don't think this loses that. I mean, I guess, of course, we, we have a situation where players can be healthy and, you know, we don't have that war. But, you know... I, there, that, I mean, there's been other th- things that have happened here that are really un, unprecedented, though, as well. So for me, although I'm a little, I have to admit, I, I am a little cynical about the 24 team idea, and I would rather it be 16. I think that this is probably the best way to go. And I think, to, I also think for me, I think once this starts to happen, I think the fans will get into this. I think that this will be. They always do, Kevin. They always do. We've seen it with the lockouts. You hear all this talk about, I'm done with hockey. I'm done with Gary. I'm done with this or that. That By the time the the puck drops for the first round, they're all back. The buildings are full. The TV ratings are high. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'll, I'll go back to yesterday when I was watching German soccer. Like, just watching live sports was just enthralling amazing like it i said i I tweeted out that it's live sports is basically my drug like (laughs) i need it (laughs) so like being yeah and then throw in it being hockey the sport that i love is my favorite sport like there's no way i'm not gonna watch it and and all that like i just it's it it, i have like if it's there i'm watching like i and it's gonna be it's going to be different, but it's still going to have that grind that the playoffs are. Especially if, especially if we get a team that, like, one of the teams that, uh, one of the teams that has to play that play in round goes all, goes all the way. Like yeah. it's. I mean, really, to me, that equates to a team that has to fight tooth and nail to, you know, down the the final ten games of the regular season to make it. Yeah. Yeah. And what one of the one of the the great what ifs um, it, when you have playoffs is what if we had this person because of injured we, be, because they weren't injured. Mm-hmm. Mo, I think most of the teams, like ninety nine percent of the players who were injured um, going into the it, it, like into the the pause, are going to be healthy at this point. So teams are going to have fully healthy lineups. Trying to trying to figure out who's going to be in the lineup and not in the lineup, like from a Canucks standpoint is quite interesting. And you're going to have that with all the teams. You're, yeah. So long yeah. as nobody goes down in the, whatever training camp happens, but yeah, uh, beyond that. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I know if we're, if we're doing the hub city thing where there's not as much travel involved, I think the quality of the hockey is going to be terrific. Well, I, and, well, other than the rustiness of the players. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, they they'll shake that off fast. I mean, we've 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 seen you know World Cups and and Canada Cups and and such in the past where they're playing before the season starts, and um, it's amazing how the rust comes off fast when they're playing something meaningful. But you know, there's going to be at least one team that just falls on their face in that play in round, and they're going to say that they weren't properly prepared. Oh well, I mean, Tampa fell on their face last year. They had 82 games to get prepared. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so if you are a top four seed, what is your strategy for this round robin? Like, are you are you yeah. playing, making sure you get your top stars in, or are you kind of balancing this out and treating this sort of as an I'm using air quotes a preseason? I think that I would I would use it as a preseason. Uh, just to clarify, is it actually are they actually doing that, or I yeah. thought they were just pairing off? Because I think depending on how many hub cities they have, last I heard was round robin. They were I'm not sure how accurate that is. Yeah, I, that's what I'm led to understand is that they were doing a round robin as well. Okay. Yeah, but at that point, yeah, you kind of want to have the, the top seed, but you're probably you're gonna you'll, you'll see teams in that in that those four teams in both. Uh, conferences, I think, tinker around, throw different players in, make sure that they're not over overtaxing uh, some like veterans and all that, just to so that uh, when they do end up 
when the 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 the, the sixteen team playoff starts that they're they're not uh, are they're not overly tired, but they're warmed up properly. Mm-hmm. I, I think you'll see the teams that know they're in for sure in that top four. I, I, you know, I think it's going to be mostly trying to figure out what their a lineup is for the actual mm-hmm. uh, meaningful rounds. It, it'll be you, know, you want to get everybody in. You want to get everybody. Um, you know, readied for the real competition, as as you've been saying. But uh, I, you know, I think it'll be a, a time for coaches to experiment with their lineups a little bit. Yeah, especially with the extended uh, the extended rosters that will likely be part part and parcel with this. Uh, they'll probably, I think, I think what I heard is they'll probably have like a 30, 30 man roster or even more, uh, just so that. Uh, because I, depending on how they they handle it, like are they going to hold pe- hold players out if they have a cough, if they uh, have a fever that's slightly above normal, like that and have an extended roster makes sense in the sense that it's not like they can just call up a guy from the farm team mm-hmm. in this situation. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what exactly uh, that entails. But uh, for the most part, I think definitely that the the top four teams in each conference are going to rotate players through very, uh, very liberally. Yeah. So uh, this is in the CBC article, Boston, Tampa Bay, Washington, and Philadelphia would compete for the number one slot in the East while defending cup champion, St. Louis, Colorado, Vegas, and Dallas would do the same in the West. So it, it, that does seem like a round Robin, but that brings another interesting point in the playoffs here, because one of the, Taught. One of the things about the playoffs is hiding injuries. And now that we have a a situation here where we have the reason, you know, if it's COVID or it's cough, I think another interesting strategy, and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I, I know that that's a really tough word to use, but this is going to be a balance of like, are you holding, like, how do you communicate injuries now? Like, because if it is, of course, if someone is, is this is a COVID case that you're holding someone out, I think that has to be publicly mentioned. But if this is a lower body injury, then obviously this is not, I don't think that this is going to be mentioned, but there's going to be a delicate balance of how injuries are going to be communicated here. And I wonder going forward if this is something that the NHL has to deal with in terms of how teams communicate injuries for the for this during this pandemic for the playoffs and then when the season comes back. Yeah, uh, I, I with the the that this was gonna, this was the, we were going to see changes in, in how uh, NHL teams report injuries. Um, in the near future anyways, with the, um, with the NHL embracing sports betting, like the NFL has. So I think we'd see a lot, we'd see more NFL style reporting of injuries going forwards anyways. And then, but now with, uh, with, with this, yeah, it's going to throw another interesting wrinkle in there for sure. Tyler, Chris, did you have any thoughts on? I, well, I mean, <laughs> this might get us on the tangent count here, but uh, you know, I, I mean, I've always thought it, it was ridiculous, or, or you know, the way that that hockey's been about I- injury uh, secrecy. You know, open it up, disclose it. You know, and then if you get a guy that 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 is deemed to have uh, attempted to injure another player, you know, and they're targeting the known injury you can ding them even harder with a suspension or something because it's all on the record that's how i look at it i i you know this idea of of injury secrecy is just silly i think but i mean if the nfl can do it anybody can do it it's kind of how Mm -hmm. you know i i I see this yeah i agree with sean in the sense that it seemed like it was kind of moving in that direction beforehand anyway this is only just going to kind of advance that timeline wise Mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I uh, yeah, it's that that I think I can I I I agree with that as well. Um I guess the only other thing is is 
Uh, and Jack talked about this when we did the uh, f- uh, federal government, uh, if the federal government uh, should be funding the CFL. Uh, he talked about, he, he brought this up about the idea of it's like, do I want Connor McDavid to be playing in a atmosphere where this could be dangerous? If, from the NHL's perspective, we'll get to the Hub City's uh, perspective here because Jason Kenney said some interesting words about this uh, in an interview. Uh, from the NHL's perspective, if there is a case, and we know in Bundesliga, by the way, there was a, a, at least two cases that I, I'm led to understand of COVID positive that injuring this test. Am I wrong there, Sean? It, it, there was, I know that there was at least one. Mike. Mike. There might there. I know there was there was some te- some positive tests. I just don't know the the the, the exact numbers. Yeah. S- does the NHL have a PR issue if that happens? Quite possibly. Like no one really knows for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if that ended up causing some drama. <laughs> it would definitely cause drama, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. I mean, there's people just lurking on the Twitter, waiting to pounce on something like this. Yeah, the, they get, as we, we were talking about earlier, how there was there's people who say they shouldn't even play at this point. That that the, the, that group of people will will pounce on just any, a miserable any positive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, any positive test or any like even like someone being held out because they have potential symptoms, they're gonna jump on it, and it's just you just gotta. It, it just comes down to how they handle it for me. Um, whether or not it's got legs. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so which leads to the hub city part, uh, Vancouver and Edmonton. Uh, well, let me correct that. The premiers of BC and Alberta have been, uh, campaigning that their cities should be the, one of the hub cities that, uh, are picked for this. Um, I'm going to start in Vancouver, and I'm going to hear from Tyler, uh, because first, and then we'll we'll go down. Uh, because John Horgan has has hampered this idea that not only should it be the Lower Mainland, but he actually went out so far as to suggest that the province of BC could host pretty much the entire, all of this, uh, all of the games can be played in Van- in BC. Um, that was his argument. Uh, he went so far this week as to suggest that the, if you doll this up, um, the Pacific Coliseum and the Langley Event Center could be used as NHL hub rinks. Would you be okay with this? Well, I, I mean, I think it would there be some great uh, civic pride and some fun, uh, economic benefits. You know, if the SABC were able to secure one of these hub city bids or whatever. Um, now the idea of of doing it in places other than Vancouver, I, I don't. I, I, the cynic in me kind of says that's a bit of a you know trying to score political points with uh, rural BC there for the premier, where where he could afford to score some political points. You know, may, you know, not not uh, just uh, appeal to the Vancouver types out there, but um, it's also, I guess, a, a way to sort of maybe offer uh, a better solution to the NHL, where you know. The, the the presence of these junior hockey rinks in other places, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the NHL would find that more attractive somehow. I, I, I don't know. I, I think, you know, John Horgan just wanted to put it all on the table there and let the league consider it. But there, uh, there is a, a bit of uh, the premier wanting to look good with certain constituencies out there. I, I think it was more political than realistic in your mind. Well, I think there's, there's a political component there certainly to, to look good to certain groups of people out there. Yeah, I think he was definitely vying for that because uh, he he was even suggesting like the minor league arenas, which I don't think he was paying attention to when Benton was talking with Ron McLean a couple of weeks back, where he said, no, like if we are doing this, we want to be in NHL arenas that have NHL level abilities, whether that's broadcast abilities, whether that's dealing with injuries, like all all those 
different yeah, detail. Yeah, I think that's been used the phrase back of house. It's 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 yeah. not it's not just finding a, a place with a two hundred by eighty five rink. It's it's everything that you don't see behind the scenes that that's important here for the player safety component and and just to practically. Uh, put on the games uh you know you need to have the four dressing rooms you need to be able to um you know turn it around in a fairly short period of time there's a there's a lot of issues there um you know just just pure space in the arena you know an nhl facility has got lots of that and, and these other ones don't yeah like it, would, it, would, it would make sense if they just used the coliseum and the one out in abbotsford and rogers arena but like if you're talking about going out to kamloops no and I would say even using Lang- the Langley Event Center and the Pacific Coliseum is is is, is a pie in the sky dream that Horgan was just grandstanding with. Mm-hmm. As, as Batman and NHL have been adamant, they want NHL arenas. They want NHL back of house infrastructure in place. They don't want to have to build things to to make this. Be- they don't want to have to spend extra money for something that's going to have very minimal revenue compared to what they're used to, um, to make this work. So, and the the plans have to, you know, have to be able to be implemented in a short period of time as well. So, you know, you know, you have everything in place at an NHL facility. Let's say it's Vancouver that does get one of these, uh, you know, hub city, uh, bids. Uh, you know, what the Canucks do is they, they play at Rogers arena and they practice at UBC. I mean, I think that they could just do that for, all the teams, right? I mean, they got the sheet, the practice facilities, uh, you know, multiple sheets available out at the university and they've got R- Rogers arena and they, they have what they need. It's done all the time. It's not, it's not, not going to new places, trying to create infrastructure on the fly. And they could even use the Pacific Coliseum as a practice. Yeah. A practice rink too. Um, but yeah, the, it's the Vancouver do, does make more sense than a lot of the other ones. I, I think they're uh, behind Edmonton just because Edmonton has got the um, – has more in, uh, infrastructure enclosed in such a small area. Mm-hmm. But they, I, I, would, I, would, I would be a lot more comfortable if I was a player uh, um, hosting – having Vancouver as a, ho- uh, a hub than Toronto at this point. I think the players would like Vancouver just on the on the basis of it's a nice place to be if you're going to be in one spot for mm-hmm. you know a few you know a couple months or whatever it's a uh, it's a nice place to be and um, uh, the the sort of the bigger public health issue that you know it's not as big an issue in BC as it is in some other places it's like Edmonton you know they they seem to have the issue uh, they seem to have a good grasp on it the my, the only negative part I have for Vancouver hosting is, is how I'm still not sure um, BC has the, um, the has COVID-19 under uh, as much wrap as they, as they are trying to uh, project out there because um, I shared the, the video that I, I watched last night yesterday um, from Vox talking about the importance of testing and, and the vault and volume testing and testing to, to cover the bases and not just test people who are need hospitalization, which is what, which is what BC did for the longest time. And, and all and with that, all that. So you don't know how many people out there are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms that are going out and, and infecting other people. Yeah. So, yeah, Testing I'll, is I'll, 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 I'll say this though. At this point, you know, this, we, we're now two and a half, almost three months into like, whoa, we have a problem here and all the restrictions and stuff. I mean, how many do you, people do you guys personally know that have been, you know, unusually sick, affected by COVID nineteen, tested positive for sure? Like, like I don't know anybody myself. I, I only hear this stuff on the news, and it, it seems to be um, the, the large, largest. A segment of the people that we hear about tend to be older people in care homes, you know? So like, um, you know, at some, at some point it's like, well, you know, maybe, maybe what they're doing for testing and not testing does have some sensibility to it. I, I just, uh, you know, there's never going to be a substitute for a hundred percent testing, right? Like if yeah. you test everybody and you have the capacity to do that, then we wouldn't be having this debate, but that's just not feasible. So how do they come up with a proper sample? And every jurisdiction has uh, some different ideas on that, but you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I have to have confidence in the BC people. I don't have a choice. They're they're what we have here. <laughs> you yeah. know, 
I, I see yeah. both sides. Yeah, because like in Alberta, we have a much higher per capita testing rate. Like I personally know like probably a small handful of people that have actually been tested. All of them have come back negative, fortunately, but at least they had the ability to be tested because they were showing some form of symptoms, whether it was something that was directly COVID related or something that they just wanted to make sure that they were being safe. Yeah. And, but that's part of part, that's again, part of the, the, the whole equation of is if a, a availability of testing and are they, uh, when you're opening up, are you risking things because you don't know, you don't have the full picture of how widespread the, the, the virus is versus, like in Alberta where we, because we have had a lot more testing and a lower um, positive, positive rate because of that, that it shows that we, despite our bigger numbers than BC, that we, but we do know that they're testing more, which it gives you a little more confidence for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but availability of testing is also huge. You can't, you can't be taking away uh potent, uh, the, the tests from the, the general public. Well, I don't think either Dr. Henry or Dr. Hinshaw will actually allow that. Um, I think Dr. Henry has been very firm in that, making sure that this there's, there's going, if the NHL is picking Vancouver, there are going to be some certain guidelines that they will need to follow. And I think Dr. Hinshaw has has said the same thing. So I'm not, but I'm not saying Dr. Henry Henry in any way is superior to Dr. Hinshaw on that. I think both doctors have said that you, if this is going to work, you're going to have to follow some guidelines that we have put in place for this to work. And I I think the NHL, from my perspective, wants to play by those rules. I like. I don't think that they are interested. There's, there's no interest in the NHL in my mind to steal tests or rush through this just to make sure that everything is okay. Well, like, Gary Bettman, I believe, has even said that too. Yes. I mean, he's, he's acknowledged that you know they're, they're they're not above the rest of society in terms of jumping the queue for testing. Yeah, yeah, but that's but again, it's all about that's what that's part of the picture that these hub cities need to um, need to take. Like look at and how how available is the testing in that area? Because it can't just be you can't just import tests from other places. Like, like and then you've got say like Toronto and Ontario and Quebec and New York where they're still battling that the COVID very very much. They're, they're still spiking and and all that. While uh, you got places like Vegas, Minnesota, Columbus. Um, uh, Alberta, so Edmonton and, and Vancouver, where the case, the at least the tested case numbers are a lot lower, and you're, you, it looks like the the it seems like the the uh, those areas have a better handle on it, and you can you can feel more comfortable bringing people into there. I guess the other side to that, before we play what Jason Kenny had to say, which I found very interesting, is part of where I think the fans are. And I, I'm are feeling a bit skittish or concerned, as I think we're all. To me, just the way that rollouts are going on in Canada, like in BC and Alberta, how specifically looking at those two areas, because uh, I feel like they've been uh, the western Western Canada. I think has has taken a very cautious approach in in reopening things. I feel like people are in that really nervous, cautious pace where we're like, okay, we're going to do this, but I'm feeling a little nervous because we know about the because second waves and, and all of these other factors that have been, been put into that have that are information that is out there, even though we don't know if it is or is not going to happen. I mean, we can certainly assume that there's going to be a second wave, but I really feel right now there's a lot of nervousness and just going forward. And I think that's part of where uh, some of the criticism that is, is coming out is, is from that nervous place. Oh yeah. That, that, that's definitely where it's coming from, but I think you still have to find a way to try and bring back some normalcy. Like you can't, in, 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 until there's a vaccine, I don't know what like, it, you never like. There's still going to be a risk, and 
you got you got to weigh it out and find out make me and do everything you can to mitigate that those risks and that's why i think what will the nhl will do is they'll try and mitigate it as much as possible and keep these players and anyone involved in a bubble as much as possible well jason kenny has a, had a different idea he did an interview with ryan rashog this is from his facebook page and i'm just going to play a little bit of this uh, and then we'll get some response because he had some interesting things to say about bubbles from a Canadian legal perspective, after the 14 days, especially if they've tested negative and they're not symptomatic, they're free like anybody else to participate in whatever else is going on. One of the uh, potentials, and, and I think we all know you could what if this thing right off the table, for sure. but one of the ones that I think has to be considered is what happens if once competition has begun, a positive test happens with a player on a roster. So player tests positive at 8 in the morning. The rest, the rest of his team needs to get on the ice that night at 7.30. Based on your public health orders, people who come into contact with someone who's known to have tested positive needs to self-isolate for 14 days. Um, that won't be the, an option in the context of a three-week three or a month-long tournament. Sure. What's the contingency plan in the event of positive tests? Well, well, first of all, anybody who, you're quite right, anybody who tests positive has to go into a self-isolation for 14 days. And obviously, in that case, that would mean not in a, uh, in a zone, but they, but they individually have to go into a hotel room for, for 14 days in that case, and unless they're symptomatic and sick. But I mean, the chances, just what we know about this uh, virus, is that uh, the chances of, of a uh, very healthy athlete in their 20s becoming severely ill from this are... Tiny, tiny uh, probability of that. Um, secondly, uh, I, I assume that well, in that situation, we require testing of everybody else that they've been in close contact with. And if the league is doing that constantly anyway, then they're on top of it. So, basically, Kenny, basically from that interview, said that if, you know, once the 14-day isolation period that the players are coming... Um, they do the 14 day isolation. They can go out in the public and hang out with, with everybody. And then the other part was of this that is so they can go play golf, whatever. And the other part of this is, is from professional athlete perspective, the, the chances of this being an issue is really small. Are you comfortable with Kenny making these statements or would you rather some more caution come from him? Oh yeah, I get where he's coming from in the sense that he's trying to make Edmonton a ideal candidate city and he's trying to just project that forward. But at the same time, I feel like he's being a little dismissive as far as like the realistic uh, reality that he, like if one player tests positive, realistically in any other situation, that entire team that he'd be competing with would also have to isolate because they've been in contact with them. But he's suggesting that that wouldn't have to happen in that case. So I, I, I think he's being a little bit unrealistic, but that's just my take. I mean, if they keep the whole bunch of them, you know, separated from the rest of society, then then I guess the you know maybe the the, the feeling there is that the, you're on your own, guys. Like <laughs> the NHL and the players, they're kind of just you know that's that's the risk that they're willing to take as long as they're not affecting other people. Then I, you know, from a public health perspective, maybe they you know they're just willing to let that fly. Um, I don't think Jason Kenny's you know wrong to suggest that a, you know a professional athlete in their twenties is probably going to be fine if they come down with a case of COVID. I, I think that's just a realistic answer there. Yeah, um, for me, I just again it comes down to what the the actual procedure is and the process is. If you have if you're testing pretty regularly and then someone just happens to to get it or get uh, it test positive and they're there's my like very they're very asymptomatic then do you go around and t- do another round of tests right away there and and see if anyone else has it and how quickly can those test 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 uh results c- come back because if you can test them and they still don't ha- and they don't have it like you're the you have the one teammate who does, and then the rest of them don't based off of those tests. Then what? Then they, I don't know what if you should um, really have them uh, isolate at that point as long as they're still being doing everything else properly. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting time frame issue as well because, like, if currently right now, I believe results are being turned around in about forty eight hours, but 
like for them to be able to host that and to be able to be on top of testing and all that, like, can they get that down to four to six hours? So that way if they test in the morning, they know by game time, whether someone can play or not, like Mm -hmm. it's, and then, but we also know that the incubation period of, of this can be up to 14 days, which is why we have that 14 day quarantine in effect. So I don't know. I think, yeah, there, there needs, it all comes down to how you handle like the process of how, how those situations should be handled and, and everything before you can really say whether or not it's, it's worth it. Like it just, I don't, I, I'm not an expert on this. I'm just going based off of all the, information that's been bomb that I've been bombarded with uh, since this all started. But I think, yeah, it just comes down to that, the process and, and how quickly these, these tests can be, can come back. Like otherwise, other than, other than that, there's, you can't really say either way. I don't think. Yeah. I guess, I guess when I heard it, I, I, I felt like Chris, it was seemed a little bit like I, I would have liked to have heard a bit more, um, like we're going to be a little bit more cautious with this, um, and I understand in this sense where Kenny is coming from politically. Trying to, he's also trying to get the economy off the ground, and he's doing the same thing that Horgan is doing and and pitching for his province. And I I get that, um, but it too. So I, I I get from that perspective. But I again I think it, this is I, I think that we're we're on the way to bringing hockey back. I think the nice thing is, is generally, I don't think that the hockey fan, I mean, as in, there's a sense of impatience here for sure, but I don't think that there's a, like a rush. Let's just do this. Even if it's not safe. I think that there's, I think most fans do agree the best way to do this is in a safe capacity. So I don't think there's necessarily a rush. On one hand, on the other hand, the NBA is talking about getting back to training camps in the middle of June and starting their playoffs in the middle of July. So um, in terms of a competition part, I could see from an economic benefit, you don't want to necessarily be behind the NBA. But I think from a fan perspective, I don't think that the rush, there's a rush necessarily, but I don't know. No, it, it, again, it's all you got to figure. And then one thing about, nice about not being the first, and you have Bundesliga in, in Germany, you've got NASCAR, um, you've got uh, Korean baseball. Um, you can learn from what they're doing yeah. and figure out how to how to handle it correctly because we haven't seen anyone test positive uh, since things have started. I don't think uh, in the Korean baseball and I'm not exactly sure I, from what I, I think I remember the, with the Bundesliga, it was a second division team or something like that. That was, that had the, the positive tests, but I don't know timeline on that either. So I think you just need to just lo- lo- learn and, and be willing to, um, to put strict, strict regulations in. And, and this is a learning process. There's no handbook for mm-hmm. it, for sure. No. Um, to me, I'm looking at these cities, though, and I think one. I, I mean, Kenny also said we ha- you have to pick a Canadian city. Um, that just makes sense. I, I, I'm not sure if that's necessarily true. I think Vegas is going to be one of the cities, though. I just think that they have the, uh, in terms of the location of the arena, I think they have that all in place with the hotels. So I think Vegas is probably going to be one. And I don't know, I as much as there's going to be some cynicism about this, there's a good chunk of players that are from Ontario and are from the eastern part of Canada. From a travel perspective, I could see Toronto being the other city. I mean, I, I hear you, Tyler, that I, the players would love Vancouver, but the the travel component could lead me to believe that Toronto could be the other city. Well, I, I think I think if we're still, you know, going to let's say they're going to have two western hub cities and two eastern hub cities, well, yeah, certainly for, for travel practicality, having something close to Ontario would be <laughs> would be good, you know. Um, I I was thinking more that Vancouver would be, you know, if you're in the Western Conference and you had to pick a place to play, well, Vegas and Vancouver would be two pretty nice places to to spend your time this summer. The forty degree weather in Vegas during the the, the summer. <laughs> yeah. 
well, yeah, be nice if you don't have to go outside, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, I think that's the biggest thing with Vegas is, is uh, the, the, the heat. And then you're going to, and then, okay, if, if you, if you go to, cause I know they were talking about just two hub cities. Um, in, if you go with say Edmonton and yeah, I guess you could go Toronto. Then you don't have to worry about 14 day quarantines. Once you get to a certain, a certain spot and you have to cross over from hub city to hub city, like one team. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Plus if you go, if you use can if you use two, two Canadians, uh, that's actually cheaper for for most of the teams because the Canadian dollar is is so crap compared to the American dollar. Good job, Canadian dollar. <laughs> it's finally a good <laughs> good opportunity to be lower than the U.S. dollar, apparently. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I I I disagree with you, Kevin. That I don't think Vegas is a slam dunk. Uh, because of the weather and the challenges of having good ice when it's 40 degrees outside. That's the only counter argument I have for that is that the Vegas arena is a fairly new arena. Sure. It's not as new as the one in Edmonton, but it should be fairly uh, technologically capable of being able to withstand the summer. Like if they can do a winter classic winter classic in Anaheim, I think that they can get away with decent half decent ice in Vegas. Yeah, they can, but the the cost of that, though, right? Yeah, I mean that's something that they would would consider. I mean, right now it seems like they got to get through the whole what's the format going to be, and then and then get to the next stage of yeah. which locations make sense to apply that format. And um, I, you know, I, I think I would imagine all thirty one teams are making their pitch for why they should be one of the places. Oh, well, I don't think Calgary's making a pitch. You don't think there's quietly some discussion in the background about that? I, I would imagine there's been uh, maybe, at least some discussion. May, maybe that, that just maybe the claims as, a, as as an organization are, but that's what I mean. Uh, like not, not a, at, a, at a franchise, you know, like not not in terms of the city of Calgary, but the Calgary Flames themselves. I'm sure have you know done some homework on this and and had some discussion with people at the league office about the merits of doing. You're doing it at the Saddle Dome, you know. I'm sure. I'm sure there's been a bit of discussion there. You, there would have to be. I'm sure there might have been discussion, but I don't think that without like support from your municipality that you're in, it's not going to go anywhere. And I just don't see yeah. Nancy giving a stamp of approval. Yeah. No, I I don't either. And I just, um, you know, I, I just think, unfortunately, I mean, Sean and Chris will, can maybe back me up on this. I just think any pitch for a hub city in Calgary would just be a PR disaster for the Flames right now. They just... Uh, if anything, that. primarily because of the uh, Cargill plant just outside of Calgary, that was the biggest, like, uh, highest concentration of COVID cases in a commercial space in North America. So just from a PR uh, angle, it just doesn't fly in my books, but that's just me. Yeah, but that being said, they're still looking at Toronto, and they're still spiking at uh, still triple digits and spiking. Is it, is it specifically spiking in the GTA or is it the in rest the of GTA, Ontario though? In the GTA. It's actually high, higher in the GTA and than the rest of Ontario. Yeah. So it's and that's why I don't don't I guess I think it'd be a PR nightmare to put it in Toronto because of that. Are, 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 are people just going to turn a blind eye because it's Toronto? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I think that's that's exactly what would happen if they uh, if if they ended up being one of the... Especially the media companies. Yeah, I, yeah. I just, it's, you know, I, I'm going to, you're going to think I'm wearing a tinfoil hat here a little bit, but I'm just going to say it anyway. I feel um, like when you look at the criticism... And the the what happened when the stampede was canceled and how people responded to that, it just feels to me that Calgary has a negative, more of a negative PR image right now than Toronto. I don't know why that is specifically, um, because if you like looking at everything, it, it would you know, it feels to me. Cal, I agree with you, Sean. Calgary seems to be doing a better job at this than Toronto, but in terms of PR. 
I it feels like Calgary is a bit better unless what happened this weekend at, at the park in Toronto changes some things. I, I just think I just think Calgary Calgary takes a bigger hit when in terms of the negative things in Toronto, unfortunately. I don't know. I think that's just our bubble though, too. Like I don't I don't I think because we're all like I don't know, sort of Tyler's social media bubble, but I know yours it centralizes around Vancouver and, and Calgary. Uh, Chris and mine definitely do as well. Um, there's two parts of that. Um, the bubbles that we're in, I think, lean a lot more, uh, lean uh, to being more crit- critical of of the conservative side of things. Um, and that's why. And you've got... Calgary being the, the the stampede being uh, a, a hot but, button a hot button topic because of the well the rodeo and and all the the animal issues there. You've got us being an oil and gas hub and 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 being a lot more of being proud of it, and that just puts a lot of people off. So I think it's just I think it's our hub. I don't I don't I don't follow a lot of people out. Uh, just the the average person who lives in Ontario, so I don't know what the what the the criticism is in there. But from what I've seen, there are people very very angry with how that how busy that that park was in yeah. in the Toronto area. I, I felt the reaction to that was the same as as some of the reactions we've seen in in BC uh, to to people gathering at Kitts Beach or in in, in various parks. It's it's um yeah I, I don't think that that changes from place to place right now. Everybody's on heightened alert about large crowds, and if they see one, then there's going to be all this criticism. And uh, you know, and I would my reaction would be going back to what we talked about earlier. You know, I would I would bet a hundred percent of those people in the crowd have no connection to anybody with COVID that they know of. Like they just it, it, they've they've looked at it like it's been long enough. We're going to live our lives yep. and suffer the consequences from there. I think maybe part of that is also. Just the, and maybe this is more specifically to where the flames are in terms of PR, um, in ter- in in that like you know with the whole arena deal, and now they're in the midst of of this um, of this pandemic. They're going ahead and and looking like they're starting the construction of this arena, um, rightly or wrongly it feels like the flames are in a negative PR space that for them to be a hub city, I think just wouldn't help the flames brand. That's sort of what I'm feeling, which is sort of interesting that I'm surprised that the Oilers are not taking the same hit because as they're pitching to be a hub city, they're also talking about cutting public transit for the summer. Yeah. I, I, I Again, it, it, yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with um, just, yeah, the optics of of through throughout for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I think at the at the Gary Bettman level, they're not going to go to places where you know the perception is going to be that they're, um, you know, it's it, it's a it's a location that's struggling with the with the issue, and then they're going to now put professional sports ahead of solving the bigger public health issue. I, I don't, I, I see the NHL as being very averse to that. So anywhere where it looks like they might um, run into a public relations nightmare that they're just not going to go there. They've got 31 NHL cities to work with. They'll, they'll find the best four or whatever mm-hmm. it takes to do this. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's certainly going to be, it'll, it'll be interesting, but at least, at least for the most part, we are on our way to somewhere where that is, we don't know, uh, but mm-hmm. you know, it's. I think it's good. It's. It's. I, and I, you know, I. I think it, 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 it's something to talk about and think about. We'll get into the matchup parts of that as soon as we kind of know. To me, right now, it's a little early to get into the matchup part because we don't know when the games are on. So I think just planting the seed for us going forward. Um, there we go. I think that's good. Um, the other thing that I wanted to get into a little bit is this, there's, you know, anniversaries have been a thing, but um, it's been six years since Jim Benning has been hired as the Vancouver Canucks general manager. Uh, Harmon Dial did a very interesting 
perspective from the athletic, which of course caused good discussion on Canucks Twitter. <laughs> um, at this point, can, um, is it fair to give Benning a grade for this year? I think you can give him a grade because they played the majority of the season. Uh, they've been in there in in the play. They were they would have been in the playoffs. At least it ha- had you gone by a point percentage, they would have been in the playoffs. Or at least they were in the bat the the battle. Um, the the his most scrutinized move in the off season, uh, the JT Miller trade, looks like an absolute win. Um, especially if they can make the playoffs and give a uh, uh, a late first round pick to New Jersey now uh, for this season, I don't know why you can't give them a, pa- a a really good grade for this for this season. Um, a lot of a mixed bag of results for the previous seasons. Some some good, like more bad than good. But I think with the I think with this season, I think you can you can say that he's done a, a decent job for to get the Canucks back to back to uh, like being talked about as as, uh, as as a team on the rise. Yeah, I think you'd have to give it a, a passing grade. I, I don't think I would give it much more than a passing grade. I mean, the Canucks don't look like Stanley Cup contenders, but. Um you know, they, they look like they've taken a big step forward and, uh, some of the aggressive moves that they've made recently to try and do that seem to be working out, such as the JT Miller deal that, that Sean mentions. Not just in terms of adding talent, but it, it looks like JT Miller's become quite the leadership presence on the team already as well, which has really helped, uh, move things along with a younger group, uh, in the post Sedin era. So, yeah, um, now the overall the six years, well, um, you know, it's had a lot of ups and downs. Uh, it, it seems like a distant memory here that uh, his first year as the general manager, of the team made the playoffs. But, but uh, you know, since then it's been a lot of time in the in the wilderness. But that's that's how it goes. You know, you, you have a, if you bring in a different manager that tries a, a different approach, uh, there's no guarantees that they would have had more playoff appearances. You know, at the end of the day, I think one of the things that's really hamstrung uh, the Canucks t- is uh, both in terms of perception and in terms of adding talent is um, <laughs> when they were finishing near the bottom, the the luck of the draft lottery didn't go their way. But they still ended up with good players. They still ended up with Elias Pettersson. They still ended up with Quinn Hughes as a couple of examples. So, um you know, it's it's been okay. Um, everybody likes to make the comparisons between this general manager and the previous one, and but they they were different different teams, different circumstances, um, inherited different different uh, talent when they came in. So mm-hmm. hard to make comparisons there between the two. I, you know, I think they both uh, Benning and and Mike Gillis, uh, you know, have performed, uh, you know, as pretty well in in, cha- in a challenging situation uh, given with what given what they were dealing with when they started yeah i, I personally think benning was kind of handed a pretty shitty uh, hand when he first started like obviously as tyler mentioned that they made the playoffs that first year but you could argue that, that was borderline flukish that season mm-hmm. and overall i'd say given the situation that benning's had like has he made it perfect decisions all along the entire way absolutely not no GM ever will. We're all human. But overall, like Tyler said, I would probably give him a passing grade overall because we're competing again. We're on the playoff. We're on that bubble for competing for a playoff spot again. And as Sean mentioned for this season, like we, based on points percentage, we would have been there. So, yeah, I, I give him a thumbs up. Now, if the Canucks can go on a run... Uh, in this, uh, in the, in the playoffs when, if and when that happens, like the, that, you can make a huge, that, that'd be a huge boom to, to, to Benning and, and everything. Um, the one, I think the one big question now is, is that to Foley trade? They gave up Tyler Madden and, and they, a really good prospect for the future, but if they can find a way to, bring back to Foley and or they go on a run and they go deep, then I think it's worth it. But again, it's just, there's a lot of risk in that. And there, people love to, uh, people love their prospects. And once you trade away one, uh, trade away uh, prospects and picks, 
that you're opening yourself up for a lot of criticism. And that, unfortunately, that's what Benning did. But I, I, again, it's I think they're, they're, the Canucks are in a better spot than they were uh, when Benning took over. Um, you can argue how much he's done to help or hinder that, but just look at the look at who the Canucks ha- like again. They on the two the two the the. The Elias Pedersen draft and the the Quinn Hughes draft. You can argue that they got the best player out of out of both those drafts, and they were picking. They didn't win the lottery, so they were they, they dropped in both those both those lotteries. So I think you at that point you have to give the the organization a, a big a big boost there, and then just hopefully they can find a way to keep all the key pieces on and off the ice. I, I feel like Benning has grown into this position more as the years have gone on. I, I mean, it, I, I mean, we, no one really talked about how. I mean, you go back to the Trevor Linden situation, which started our hockey podcast history. Uh, you know, I mean, Benning was put in a really awkward position where he had to speak for the organization, and he wasn't. He's not a guy necessarily super comfortable in front of the microphone. It's certainly not a Trevor Linden in front of a microphone. But I think he's found his own little niche here. And I think the last couple of years, you look at some of the trades he made. You look at the JT Miller. You look at Tyler Toffoli. Um, you know, Tyler Mott. I, I mean, for the Vanek trade, that wasn't a super great trade. But he's been he's been a bit more shrewd. Uh I mean, and the drafting certainly seems to be going on the right direction. Even, you know, like, yes, we talk about Pedersen and Hughes, but what about Adam Gaudet? What about a Thatcher Demko? What about a, a number of other draft picks that they, they have accumulated over the years? Uh, I mean, there's the Louis Erickson albatross that will always hinder him. But again, like Chris says, there's a lot of GMs that made a lot of mistakes I don't know. I feel like he's grown into the position that he's in. I think he certainly learned the the PR part of it a lot uh, better over over time. You know, there's there's um, more consistent messaging now um, from press conference to press conference with Jim Benning. There was a lot of contradictions actually when there was when Lyndon was around. You'd have him saying one thing and Benning saying another, and I think it just it just you know they just weren't really e- explaining themselves very well. And I think you know now when you hear Jim Benning in a press conference, there, there's you, you hear the conviction there. You you, you really get the sense he, he believes in what he's doing and he and he has good reasons for it, and he, he seems to be able to communicate that a little better than he did when he first started and and uh you know hopefully that gives the the fans of the canucks uh, a little more confidence in what he's doing but really from the start i mean the guy the guy you know has a, a background in scouting and that's all along that's where his strength has been and where the organization has been improving they're, they're deeper because of their of their scouting yep sean chris did you have anything to add to that no nope. I thought he kind of hit it on the head. And I also did forget, too, Pod Coles and Hoglander this year. Um, that Those are guys that I think will are going to be part of the organization. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't really think that uh, – I don't want to get into the Judd Brackett thing, but I think he, he's – to me, I think this is a guy, you know, even if you're – whatever side you're on. Jim Benny knows what he wants now. And I think a few years ago when he stepped into this role, he didn't. Um, and I think that, that to me bodes well for where the Canucks are going to go is because I think Jim Benny has that confidence under his foot that even if a Judd Brackett leaves or not, I still think the Canucks would be in good shape. When Jim Benning came along, I mean, he stepped into a situation where, I mean, Mike Gillis, he got literally run out of the building one night. I mean, there was the fire Gillis chants were, were, were being heard in Rogers Arena, and he was gone the next day. So it got pretty toxic, right? So I think, you know, so the first couple of years were really about trying to clean up the brand, try to try to make peace with the fans a little bit, turn the page on the 2011 era team, you know, and start moving in a different direction. But it takes a really long time to do that. It's hard to get patience from fans in Vancouver without that Stanley Cup winning uh, legacy behind them. You know, I mean, it's we all went to that game in Calgary there in late December. And, it, you know, it's hard to ignore those that that 1989 Stanley Cup. 
cup banner hanging there at the saddle dome, right? They, you know, we don't, I talk about this all the time. That doesn't exist with the Canucks. So, um, so it's a little bit hard when you're in, in the down years to, to get the patience from the fans. Um, so, you know, yeah, he, he you know, he, yeah, he probably wasn't really sure what, what approach to take initially other than to try and, make peace with the fans a little bit they got that first playoff appearance in the first year and now it's really been about how do we um transition from the Sedins to a new core and you know i think this year for overall if you're a canuck fan you got to be happy with the product it's been exciting it's been a, a hard-working team um the, the the personalities are interesting they've made some deals you know they got a great goalie there's lots to like there the coach seems to be well regarded you know now they just got to get it done when it really counts I agree. You're here. You're here. Uh, so we usually end up with a fun question. And uh, as we are recording, um, two golf legends, one named Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson, will uh-huh. be uh, playing. Uh, it's Tiger Woods and Peyton Manning versus Phil Mickelson and Tom Brady in a uh, – sort of a fun golf match to raise funds for COVID relief. Um, I'm sure Peyton Manning will have a lot of funny things to say. Um, I hope he throws a football and hits Tiger Woods in the head and then yells at him. (laughs) Because that's the best SNL, one of the best SNL skits ever. Um, (laughs) um, uh, But if you had a golfing three other people that you would want to be on your, if you were a golfer, I'm not a golfer, but I'll I'll go on this trip too. Who would you? Who would be three golf pe- people you would want to golf with? Um, are we just are they uh, golfers or just uh, anyone? 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 Yeah. Uh, Charles Barkley. I want I want to I want to hang out with him while he tries to swing. That's makes me feel better about my golf game, and he'd be quite the. He just, I'd probably be in tears laughing for most of the round, which would be awesome. Um, <laughs> I, uh, Kevin Bieksa, just for the same reason, uh, he'd probably beat me up on the course because that's apparently what they do on golf course, on the Bieksa golf co- golf uh, tournament. But again, that'd be fun. It'd be just, it, I, for me, golf is all about uh, hanging out with with. With, with your friends and shooting the shit. So give me anyone who can talk and, and tell stories. So, so again, that's the ex Barkley. And then you can throw in like, I, I even throw in like a Michael Buble, just again, someone who can talk and just would be hilarious to hang out with. And you get the, you get hit like the, some of the stories that you can hear. I think that's, that's what that would be. And give me, give me a full, like, as many as many rounds as I can in 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 a weekend, but those three and I think I'd be happy. I I, I was thinking Kevin Bieksa would be one of them. I, this is this might be out of out of uh, right field, shall we say? But uh, Jose Bautista, I think you know, <laughs> if you were getting frustrated on the course, the theatrics and the 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 muttering and the the cussing that would <laughs> ensue there, I think mm-hmm. that that would be quite hilarious. <laughs> um Kawhi Leonard, the fun guy. Uh that would be how would you be with Kawhi? The guy's gigantic. Imagine the bombs he'd be hitting off the T box. <laughs> you know, that'd be good. And uh and then uh, uh who would be my fourth one? That's uh, you know, I didn't have time to think about this ahead of time, but um I just came up with it this morning. Sorry, I usually, yeah. usually... No, that that's okay. That's okay. Um Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers. I I think that that you know he's he's it, it's fun you know watch him play football and and he just he gets that look in his eye when he feels like he's gonna make a good two minute uh, two minute drill happen and throw the hail mary at the end and stuff and I, I just think you know he he'd be a bit of a colorful character to be on the golf course with especially if he was getting on a roll the the, the confidence would just be oozing. <laughs> In the spirit of not taking anyone else who's previously been taken, I'm just going to go with three people that I think would be super fun to hang out with for a day and go golfing with. So the three that I chose, Shaq, Marshawn Lynch, and how can you not go with Sherman? Damn, oh, he, was yeah, on my list. 
He was on my list. Uh, you might yeah. not get a word in uh, on the course <laughs> if you're playing. Oh, I don't need to get a word in if those three were there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think the others would get a word in with Richard. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what would make it so entertaining. Yeah. Uh, one guy that I just thought of um, would be awesome would be Dan Quinn. Uh, he played NHL uh, for a while and then became uh, then took up golf and and he actually was Ernie Els' caddy for a few years and did the the celebrity like golf uh, tour and all that. So he, the stories you would hear from not only his playing hockey playing days but his golf caddying and everything would be pretty awesome. Um. So my three. Well, one was taken, so I'm going to think of another one. But Jillian Fisher, Rick Dollywall, <laughs> and I, I, if I could make it a five, five some Jason Bruff and Matt Sakaris would be hilarious. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you wouldn't get a word, a word in edgewise. Nope, not, no, I would not. I would be like Chris, and I would just be sitting and, you know, don't have to wait for me, but it just would be, it just, that would be so fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Sean, you think Charles Barkley's swing is bad? You should see mine. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I know I've, I've seen Chris's, and it's not good. Yeah, Kev, I'm probably not much better than you. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I take the approach of I'd rather have a shorter drive and stay out in the middle of a fairway somewhere than than go for the glory and uh, be zigzagging across from trees to trees. <laughs> Because yeah. that's what happens. I end up in the trees, and to get out of the trees, I'm 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 just zigzagging across now. I mean, it, it's it's not very efficient. Just you know, get it on get it on the fairway and make a good second shot. If you can get on the green in three, you're having a good day. That's how I look at it. Yeah, yeah. My, my philosophy is if I could hit the ball within three swings, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> As long as I don't 45 it into the shrub off the tee box, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we usually also do our draft reviews. We are not, this week we are not doing that. We're going to be recording that later in the week because we are going to have Jack from Oilers YYC Podcast join us uh, to talk about the 2012 draft. And it's the, the significance of that, that and reason we're bringing him on is that Nail Yakupov was the first pick of that draft for the Edmonton Oilers. And again, we're not picking on the Oilers, but I, it's, it's a fascinating look to look back and see that even as we go through that era of the three straight Oiler picks, what rebuild you, version two, what's that rebuild version two. Yes. They're right. on three or four at this point, I believe. Yes. But we're not picking on the Oilers. <laughs> it's like it's sort of like it's it was pre like it's sort of this maybe it's kind of like the phases that we're going through with COVID. That this was that was phase two. You slowly rebuild, then you go back in. You're back in lockdown, and then you you get a Connor McDavid. See, so we're not picking on the Oilers. No, <laughs> we, don't, we don't do that here. <laughs> no. No. Uh, but yeah, yeah it's that I, it'll, it'll be fascinating to hear that perspective and Jack's always got a lot of good insights and stuff so uh, I just want to point out we've been very complimentary of the merits of Edmonton as a hub city okay so we're not anti Edmonton no no, <laughs> no no per se we just take our jabs at the Oilers because we can <laughs> yes anytime you use per se is you know, <laughs> it's a good day <laughs> yes we need to use more per se, but yeah. uh, we'll, we'll leave it there. Uh, Devin and Heidi should be back. Follow Heidi at Hide Amazeballs. Follow Devin at Gord Howell nine. How do we follow you? I am BD connect zero three <laughs> on the Twitter. And I'm on the Twitter at T noble, T N O B L E. And I am at Schneiz on most social media. I'm K E V with his head. <laughs> K E V O L E. Devin is Gord Zero nine. Thanks yes. for the hint. There, yes. Uh, Lord how zero nine. Follow him for all the pictures of his dog. Yes. Uh, this is like uh, talk show hosts when they when they um, mention the call in phone number. You know, it's not six zero four. It's six zero four. Is where you got it. <laughs> yeah. the, 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 there's no O on the keypad to dial yet. Well, there is, but <laughs> it's not. It doesn't match the zero. Yeah. And then hey, hopefully uh, next week we'll be. Uh, 
we can review uh, Kevin and Tyler's uh, shotgun Friday attempts. Uh, yeah, about that. Uh, very quickly, uh, I'm on call for my work this weekend, so I, I didn't think it would look good with my uh, colleagues there if I was shotgunning yeah. beers on Twitter. But I'll I'll uh, make it up to you at some point there, Sean. Yeah, all right, sounds good. Yeah, they were. <laughs> and, and Heidi, as well, who I see is it has uh, has uh, emerged on the side of the screen, <laughs> who was uh, yelling at me at the time to uh, do better, Tyler. So I'll, I'll try and do better uh, for you as well, Heidi. <laughs> I've also probably have failed at that as well. <laughs> and I will try to do better. But I'm not a professional shotgunner, so yeah. Neither are Sean and I. It's just yeah. practice makes perfect. Yeah, it's, it's true. My friends have been uh, pushing me hard here to pick up the, the pace, and I, I feel I'm doing that. Okay. So there we go. <laughs> they're, they're younger friends than I am, so I, I have to work a little harder at it, as I say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. We will talk to you all soon. Bye from everyone. Bye for now.